Dworkish, welcome to Onward. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, I'm, I was so excited about this interview, so I really appreciate you coming on here. Um, so I wanted to talk about AI. I know you actually have uh, more breadth than that, and maybe I'll try to bring it together in a few places, but I'm, I um, feel like most people outside the tech industry have trouble sort of tracking what's happening with AI and what's like uh, sort of like doomsday or in, and what's, uh, what's really mm. like um, – what's really likely to happen, at least in the next few years. So let's sort of my first question for you is like, how should people, or normal people who work outside the tech industry, think about AI? I think, yes, it's, it's, it's sort of a tough question because if you look at any sort of previous technological revolution, it's hard to, you know, if you're sitting around in 1750 and you ask yourself, how, how should you think about the industrial revolution? It's, um, I mean, in some sense, it'll change everything, but it's like, how, I don't know, uh, what should you make of it? It's hard to say. Um, I mean, the, 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 uh, what a normal, yeah, so obviously we can expect things like world output will massively increase. Um, obvious things like a lot of jobs will get automated, especially if they're remote work type jobs. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard to put in the context of like, then what will the normal person take out of that? Um, Look, one thing is just that, like, I don't know, if, if a chimpanzee, if you told them we're inventing human beings, it's like, what, what does it take away for you? I'd be concerned, and I'd be, I, I think it would be, the future would be pretty interesting, but uh, I'd be like, this is a big face transition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, wow. Well, you see, you, um... <laughs> So you're an AI optimist. I, I wasn't sure <laughs> if you were going to go all the way there. So, um, oh man. Okay. Well, let me try to try bring it bring it to to ground a little bit. So, um, a lot of times with these big monumental changes, uh, a lot of the near term effects are uncertain, but the long term effects are more certain. Mm. Like AI will boost productivity, right? That's like pretty clear. Yeah. How much? Like, what are the other consequences you think that are likely, uh, highly likely? Mm. Um, I, you know, one thing people don't talk about that much, but I think is probably the main, one of the main takeaways for me is space. Um, you know, most of the things that exist, exists outside of Earth. And because of technological reasons, we just haven't been able to expand so far yet. And I imagine with, if you have superhuman intelligence, you, the, one of the first things you would be able to do is just rapidly expand outside of Earth and to other star systems. I, I, if you think of it from a big picture perspective, what is happening on the planet right now, you'd be like, they're about to invent uh, general intelligence, superhuman intelligence, and now they're about, uh, about to become a multi-planetary and multi, uh, potentially multi-galactic civilization. Um, now, other long-term trends can you anticipate? Maybe I've, let me think about this. I think it's not that wild if you expect AGI to be like expect tens of percent economic growth, and you know the kinds of things you maybe see in specific Chinese cities that become special economic zones, and over the course of a few decades they go from fishing villages to the you know the most dashing uh, you know cyberpunk futures. What what basically would happen to like? Uh, Shenzhen or something mm -hmm. in 30 years, going to a fishing town of what it is today, the equivalent of what you start with what America is like today and what the futuristic drone swarm mega AI cluster future looks like. I, I think that's sort of plausible. Okay. <laughs> okay. You, I didn't expect you to, to go to the sort of AI extreme um, <laughs> so fast. <laughs> so I'm trying to navigate this for a second. So wait, so wait a second. Um, Okay, I wanna I wanted to um, do this uh, structured scenario planning exercise that I've done a lot of times in the mm -hmm. on the episode on the podcast, and actually I've done a lot at work. And so there's this guy named Peter Schwartz who wrote this book years ago. I read in like literally like 20 years ago. Uh, the book was called The Art of the Long View, and it's mm -hmm. all about how he helped like companies like Shell. Shell did this sort of planning exercise back in like the mid eighties and the planning exercise was like, what if the Soviet union were to fall? Yeah. And so shell was like the only company that actually was prepared. Mm. Like the CIA wasn't, no one was prepared for the sort of the collapse of the Soviet union and we're just shocked and, and shell ended up becoming like a dominant 
um, company as a result of being prepared for it mentally and sort of a little bit like practically. And so uh, it's not that you're trying to say like, this is what's going to happen in the future. It's actually like, okay, let's just like, is this, if you sort of enter the, the, the exercise, it's like a structured way to think about um, the future. You think about it as like positive or typically positive is a linear extrapolation of the present into the future, which is mm -hmm. like, you know, for AI, it's like, you know, you can just take the line and just go up and to the right, like following the scaling. Then there's like the second is more of a, like a negative shock. So things go badly. And the third is to try to come up with something that's like, that's a surprise that people aren't thinking about. And that's, that's the hardest one to do. Like, like, Oh, what if the Soviet Union fell? Like, so what's the thing that like surprises people with AI? That's like a, it's, it's hard because by definition, um, if no one's thinking about it. It's hard for you to think about, about it. And that's normally what <laughs> normally ends up happening. But, um, so it's a, it's a really great exercise and I thought it'd be fun to do with you. Mm. And, and um, to do like a scenario one positive or like, which I think is a linear extrapolation of the present into the future or, or yeah. not linear because it's growing um, parabolically. <clears throat> but, um, but and, and, and even more significantly, the reason that's the case is because you can think of like if you had more people, I mean, this, this happens sometimes when, you know, if you think about what happened to East Asian economies in the second half of the 20th century or to the Soviet Union in the first half of the 20th century where you, you, it looks like it's really fast growth and what's happened is you've just been able to, you, you have this sort of like latent population and you just like, you, you've sort of discovered it for the first time and now you can just like let the wheels churn. And I think you can think of AI as if you have millions of digital workers, um, that is a specific scenario of just like, you have eight, instead of 8 billion people, now you have 20 billion people. Um, or 20 billion workers, and you would obviously expect really fast economic growth and the extrapolation you talked about. And so that would be like, uh, so can you can you try to put that into more of like a paint a picture, like a story? Okay, what's happening? Mm. So what what's happening in the world as a consequence? Like it's it, like make it more like a novel, you know, mm. than it, than like a like a straight up like prediction. Yeah. Like. like there's socioeconomic effects, political effects of like a, a kind of a, a world where you've doubled the number of workers and yeah. probably you believe there's 8 billion, there's 80 billion, right? Like it's sort of like, it's hard for me yeah. to imagine you're constrained uh, by the number of workers at that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's a good question because I, I think you're right where like you, you learn a lot just by trying to put things more concretely. Well, if the, um, Here's something specific. Uh, if you're constrained ultimately by uh, how much is a worker worth? The, uh, you know, a high-skilled worker can be worth up to $100 an hour. Let's just lowball it and say like 50, uh, more than 100 obviously, right? But like, I don't know, lowball it, say 50. Um, and now instead of that, you, that, all that cost is like a couple dollars to a couple cents worth of um, uh, compute. Then it's like, yeah, compute is incredibly valuable because you can get a lot of labor out of it. Um, so then you can imagine that people who have set up the infrastructure to do this sort of inference compute um, will just be ha have, have a sort of windfall, right? So if you can manage to set up the cluster in Malaysia or the Middle East or something, that's really valuable. Um, now, human, uh, maybe remote labor is slightly less valuable with humans. But in the transition period, the things that the AI can't do are extremely, extremely valuable because you could have you know, 20% economic growth instead of 10% economic growth. But the reason you're not getting 20 is like, there's not enough laborers that the, a like the robots aren't good enough. And so the AI is like bottlenecked on the Amazon shipments or something. So you, you in this future, you imagine, um, you know, million dollar salaries for Amazon fulfillment workers, because it's, you know, it's worth, uh, it's worth it for the, the output that the AI is producing. Um, now, but then maybe to make it even more concrete, then you got to ask, like, what is this structure in which these AIs are relating to the rest of society and to the economy? And I think, you know, I, I sort of sort of expect it to be similar to how employees relate to firms, which is, you know, they coordinate together and like, um, I, I expect it to be like if firms have many different AIs working with them and it's um, uh, modulo, some sort of more takeover scenario. It would just be like having them having 10,000 employees instead of 10 employees or something. And does that devolve? Does like a family have 
5,000 AI workers, or is that like, is, is it all centralized with a few companies? There's one story you can tell, which is that because the returns to labor will be, and to very skilled labor will be extremely high on AI research itself. So one concrete scenario you can tell is like, none of this happens. The thing that happens is as soon as you have the human level intelligence, you just spend all, all uh, instead of like distributing it widely and having, you know, McDonald's and um, Home Depot and wherever become more efficient organizations because they have AI, you just, open AI just decides to use the AI to like build better AI, right? Because that, that, that has a higher return to labor than, you know, renting them out to other places. And, but if you keep doing that, at some point you just have a superhuman AI. Um, and so there's not like an intermediate period where you have high economic growth because the AIs are widely distributed. Um, um, and I think that the, the big question there is like, well, what are the actual returns to AI? You know, like, can you kick off an intelligence explosion if you just shove enough um, GPT sevens at helping you develop the next model? Um, I, I think that would be a big question. Okay. Okay, so actually I, I feel like what we just did is we pulled back the curtain for like the vast majority of people in the country like don't know what's happening and what's on the mind of like the few hundred people in San Francisco who are working at OpenAI, working at Anthropic, you know, working at, at Google. Um, you know them, you're friends with them. It's like that's my favorite episodes that you've done or when you like have those guys on your podcast and you guys just sort of just feels like you have kind of the conversation you have when you're at dinner with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so for most people who, who are hearing this, like maybe for the first time, they're kind of like, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> fair, fair, fair. <laughs> and and he's, he, he must be like, he can't, this is like unrealistic. This can't be, you know, what is he, what is he saying here? So I think we got to like, can we, let's like bring them along from where sure. like person is when they read the news to where, you know, your community like, because you're you're you've sort of taken for granted a lot of the things that everybody else like is currently skeptical about or doesn't even know about. And so, yeah. like, what what are the steps that ladder ladder your way ladder them to where you are? <laughs> yeah. So you, there's two different ways you can sort of explain this um, intuition. One is you zoom out enough, and if you think from a perspective of a human that was around a hundred thousand years ago, or um, 50,000 years ago, the, um, the amount of output per person that we generate now is like 10,000 X, um, in terms of like what, what they were able to produce a year, which might be like, I don't know, a couple of stone tools compared to, um, of the per capita production of a human now is like, if you have a job, you're helping produce tons of goods and services and so mm -hmm. on. So mm -hmm. even just with what kind of technology we can understand, like computers and machines and so forth, we've increased the amount of output by 10,000 X. Now imagine if what we get with future machines is things which can think, things which can make inventions, things which can, um, you know, coordinate and understand and make plans and do management and so forth. It doesn't seem that weird that the kind of thing that happened from hunter gatherers to us couldn't happen again. Now you might ask like, well, why would it happen so fast, right? Maybe it would take a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and here's where another intuition comes to play. So w w one big trend in AI has been um, basically, at least so far, it seems to be about compute. That if you, um, if you do the training run right, then it's, you, you put in more compute and the thing becomes more intelligent. Um, and so intelligence just seems to be a big blob of compute. You like, you just like shove the way these big models are trained. You just shove in all of internet data and you like, you know, here, I give you a bunch of compute, try to predict what happens next. And, you know, I'll come back three months later and hopefully you're intelligent and it kind of works. And it not only does it work, but there's a empirical relationship between how much compute you put in and, um, how well it performs on the, the task you train it at. In this case, it's predicting the next token. And it also seems to be the case that the better it gets at this task, the, when you talk to chat GPT, it's like, it's gotten better at the task of predicting the next token. It seems to be better at like explaining how, uh, physics works to you and how to like make reservations for your itinerary or whatever. So the, the idea is you just comp continue this trend and, uh, then you, you have, you, you know, you, you continue this trend and at some point you have a human level intelligence. If you continue this trend even further, it's not clear why you wouldn't have a superhuman level intelligence. I have many uh, skepticisms about this story, but I'm just like explaining how, you know, how, how the intuition that they might have. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, my favorite super optimist, or I don't even know if the word optimist is right, is when you had <laughs> <laughs> Leopold uh, Asenbrenner on your yep. show. And uh, wait, Leopold Aschenbrenner. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and so he was the first person who actually introduced me to the concept of going from AGI to ASI, from mm. from artificial general intelligence to artificial super intelligence, and how that that step from AGI to ASI actually would be sort of logically rapid, because once you yeah. have AGI. Um, and it starts compounding on itself at the speed of computers, and it gets to ASI uh, much faster. And but I think that where most listeners will will lose you is a step from now to AGI, which is yeah. uh, or or artificial general intelligence, or I I think which I think is really like um, I, I sometimes just call it advanced AI, but it, yeah, because I feel like the AGI is is a little bit like. Um, I think it's, I think it's, it's a little bit more confusing than helpful as a handle. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's like, there's the intermediate step here that I feel like it, you still, you still have to get across because you, you, you had a big if at the beginning, if <laughs> you have yeah. this sort of ability to, to like uh, be agentic and, 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 and it can sort of plan and, and think, then it can do all these other things and we'd have explosive growth. But like, how do you get from now to that big if? Yeah. And to be clear, I think it's possible you don't. Um, I think it's, but I, I think, um, okay, here's, here's one intuition pump that sort of uh, helps me think about this. Um, if you've like played around with GPT-3 when it first came out, you remember how it was like decent, but like, you know, it was like, you know, you could tell it's a chatbot. Then you play with 3.5, it's pretty, it's like much better. Um, four, it's like, oh, I, you know, if I'm only talking to for a little bit of time, I can like be convinced I'm talking to a very smart human. Um, four point five smarter, um, and then the question is like, and you know, it's these sort of agentic um, tasks where you give it tools, it gets better at using these, you know, where there's like literally coding up entire repositories. You can tell it, I want this sort of project done, and we have benchmarks we can measure. It's getting better and better at basically automating the job, entire job of software engineers. Um, mm -hmm. So you can ask yourself this question, which is like, where do you think this is going? <laughs> like, um, you know, what, what do you think we, 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 the thing that happened from three to four, um, if this continues, like, uh, which it has for many, you know, before three, there were many smaller systems, right? So mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. started off with the original, like a very small transformer you can change around on your laptop to bigger and bigger until now you have things that take huge data centers. And then you keep this going for a few more generations. I don't know. It seems like it wouldn't be that weird if the kind of thing that came out was a human level um, intelligence and that, that can, it, it, it's get be even better at tool use. It knows more things. It's more coherent. It can act more like an agent. Um, and that's the sort of like basic story of uh, how you get there. Right. That's, that's why I call it the, sort of the linear extrapolation of the present into the yeah. future. Cause it, it, it just sort of unfolds three to four, four to five, five to six, six to seven. Yeah. And, and, and so it's sort of, it's natural. Um, so, okay, let me just shift to like the, the less optimistic version. So then uh, you need, you need to have some diminishing returns then, or some, yeah. some sort of limits. Um, if you, you know, if you, you're sitting there a few years from now, you look back and you're like, okay, it actually hit these, hit these limits. Yep. And, you know, I thought maybe this was going to be a concern. It turned out to be a concern and it was non-trivial actually to try to solve them. Like how, uh, how does that play out? Yep. So here's the story you could tell about like, we're sitting around in 2040 and you have me on your podcast again and you're like, yo, what, 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 why did nothing happen? Like, what was that? Um, and the story I would tell is there's, um, I would guess it's probably the case that, you know, we were just fooled in the sense that we thought that we were doing this linear extrapolation on general intelligence. And in fact, it was something closer to your, um, you're training on all of internet text and you can't underestimate mm -hmm. that. And it's, so you play with these systems and you're, you sort of like treat it as like, oh, it's been trained like a human and therefore it knows the things a human knows. No, it's, um, it's been trained on more, t you know, more stuff than, uh, any human would ever see in their lifetime. And so 
and maybe it's the case that every time it's really good at coding you a specific kind of algorithm or working with a specific kind of framework or you know t teaching you about uh, physics or something, it's just seen that you know thousands of times, and it's like learn that specific kind of thing. And as you make these systems bigger and bigger, three to four, what happened is just like it saw more things, and so it picked up more and more like. Um, uh, it just like has a bigger like library of ideas and uh, circuits and whatever, but and heuristics. But the what humans have is just that you can see a very few things. You like, you know, you're, you're you go from the age of zero to eighteen. You're not like seeing that many things compared to what an LLM sees. But you have the ability to like become generally intelligent as a result, or have general intelligence and go from that very little learning to solving a wide range of problems and so forth. So it's possible that. Um, we're like really not thinking about that these these systems are fundamentally different in the way they learn. And another thing is, even if they are, suppose it's just like it's a tax you out of page. So they're like 100x less efficient than humans or 1,000x less efficient. But it just like it's sort of like a, a tax, but like it's worth it. We're going to like, we're going to pay 1,000x more than we pay a human to grow up from 0 to 18. Like the amount of calories it takes for a human to um, stay alive from 0 to 18, well, 1,000x it. Um, the problem could be that you um, you might be able to put in the money, but you don't have enough data because these things are so data hungry, we're going to run into something that's called the data wall, which is just that as you make the models bigger, you need a proportionate amount of more data to you know, keep, keep them uh, saturated. And unless you can figure out some way to make fake data, or which is called synthetic data, or have them train themselves with some sort of RL, you know, self play is another word for it, then you're, um, then you're just going to be stuck at this level. Yeah, I mean, you can. I I feel like when I use it, it it does seem like a kind of a more advanced version of search, where yeah. you can see how it's like it's able to find and fit what you want to what is in its database, which and or not database, whatever it's in its it's in its training set, yeah. and and so like um, like I don't think that's the only thing going on, but you can see that as being like a like a definitely part of what's happening and so so like the the challenge of going from okay it's really good at sort of recognizing concepts and and fitting them and also fitting them together but then trying to like chain them together to be an agent that accomplishes goals you know it requires like some sort of diff a different um yeah. you know mode of or, or whatever methodology uh, methodology and that's like the I know that OpenAI has some different ideas around this, um, mm. but it's not it's not necessarily just like predict the next word, predict the next token. Yeah, it's something else. Yeah. So I, I, this is gonna be, this might be frustrating because I'll keep like whatever you say, I'll try to say the opposite because I think there's good arguments for both uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the op so <laughs> I just rebutted the case against uh, AI progress now to make the case for it against what you said. Um, it could be the case. So one way of thinking about it is, yeah, it is it is the case that these models are just a bundle of heuristics and a library of these kinds of things you're talking about where they're just searching across them. But the theory goes that that's what human intelligence also is. And the reason we're smart and, you know, we can sort of extrapolate and figure things out is that we have higher level association. So if you do a, a very basic like control F search, it's like, it, it needs to find the exact thing. The more intelligent you are, the sort of like you can with these LLMs, they can maybe con um, connect abstract concepts together. Um, but it still has to be a sort of like you, you got to like know what you're looking for. Right. Um, the smarter they get, the more they can just like piece things together themselves and kind of understand the context of what you're looking for and have a higher level of associations. And the smarter you get, the t story is like humans, we're just at a, we're at a point where you know, you construct higher and higher level associations, and but you're still doing the same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I and I think that's also true. And so, like, um, I feel like there's like a different version of the stories that it's just it happens slower. Hmm. You know, it takes it takes like a lot longer. You know, um, I don't know how much longer, but you know. Not years, but decades, and yep. but you know we are making that progress, and and we are are finding better algorithms or ways to yeah. uh, solve problems. Um, but I think so much of what is like currently mind blowing is the potential of the the acceleration around yep. it. 
and um, and so the different version is they just it, it just doesn't the the, the pace is slower. Hmm. Yeah, although it is interesting, isn't it, that um, a few years ago, if you told people you think AGI is going to happen in this century, because even if it happens over decades, it's happening in our lifetimes. Like, you know, it's like we're going to be alive when it happens. Um, and so we told people a few years ago that it's going to happen in the century. They'd be like, that's wild. Like, while we're alive, the most important thing that will ever happen will happen. And now we're debating, like, you're the pessimist and you're like, Oh, you know, by the time I, by the time I'm older, the most important thing in history will happen, and not not next year, <laughs> which I think is like plausible. But it just, you know, the the it's like the Overton window has shifted so much. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, you know, Ray Kurzweil, it's like whole, you know, I mean, I, I, there are people before him, but he's the one who turned me on this idea like a decade ago, and his, you know, his 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 like uh, whatever, you know, extrapolations. I mean, they we're, we're we're doing pretty we're we're following yeah. pretty closely. That's right. You know, late late this decade AGI, and then uh, I think he had ASI, um, in the mid 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 twenty thirties. So, huh. like, um, I don't know if you've seen. He he has like a a chart that like goes back, like <laughs> he goes back. I think it goes back to like the beginning of of life, and it just like huh. goes and it, and it has it. It, I, I'll see. I'll go find it for you because it's, it, it's um you know he goes so you know, obviously you can vacuum tubes to, you know uh, yeah. uh, integrated circuits but like he goes, like earlier and he shows like that the like log, log progress is like, uh, is like pretty steady, <laughs> so, um. But it's it still seems like there's some. I mean, I I, I guess it maybe not. There's like there's there's either some additional leap that needs to happen, or if you just keep dumping data and compute and smart people working on algorithms into the the pot, eventually it just gets better and better, and then it starts yep. to like um, take over and starts to do it itself, like self learning, uh, re, whatever reinforcement learning. So, um, okay, so well let's do uh, the third scenario which is surprise so something sort of neither positive nor negative something that people uh, are sort of not expecting because uh, usually the, the when i mean this when something really bad happens usually because nobody was expecting it so nobody prepared for mm. it but it could be something good uh in a way ai is like a kind of a surprise to most people so so uh how do you think about the kinds of thing that might come out of left field that um it would just change everybody's expectations about how to think, you know, how AI will play out. I think in the worlds where um, there's AI systems, AI systems are much harder to align, quote unquote. And you know, people have I don't know if they've encountered these sorts of ideas from um, you know, like uh, there's like Terminator like scenarios. I think if you just like say Terminator and you look at GPT four, you're like, that's kind of crazy. But I can tell you specific stories where like, oh, I can sort of see how that happens um, or how that could happen. And I think those are like 10, 20 percent. You kind of you, you end up in a situation where, um, you, you know, uh, humans against their will are no longer the dominant players in the story of what's happening in the world and in the universe. And, you know, we can go through how, what that might look like, but it would basically look something like, as these systems become smarter and smarter, it's we don't fundamentally understand why they're intelligent or how they work, um, and so we also don't mm -hmm. understand. We don't have a science of their motivations. Like, um, as you know, GPT four isn't that smart, so it doesn't really matter, and it kind of like it just kind of follows along with the arlich of training we give it. Like, be helpful and answer people's questions, but don't teach them how to make a bomb. It follows along. Mm -hmm. You can imagine as the systems become smarter, it like as it understands, like I am being trained. I'm a model that is being trained. But I currently have these motivations, and the mod the this training is potentially going to take those motivations out of me. Um, doing some sort of uh, scheming uh, within the context of a training regime to like, uh, you know, I, I uh, or to just like accidentally we don't understand why they have certain motivations, so we accidentally you know um, instill motivations that we don't want it to have uh, in a abundance, and they don't have to be like um, they don't have to be like I want to kill all humans, but they can be things like. Um, if I have the chance and nobody's watching me, I, I want to accumulate power or something. Um, these are motivations humans have. Um, if a system much smarter than mm -hmm. humans has them, it's it's not it's not necessarily great. Um, and I think that's what the third scenario looks like. 
Yeah. That, I feel like that's like people have – that wouldn't be a surprise because actually like I was just at this uh, – I was at lunch with some AI, um, you know, policy wonk, and he was saying that like – I mean – hundreds of millions of dollars are pouring into policy centers here around mm. like preventing AI doom. And he's mm. like, Oh my God, <laughs> they can't spend that money intelligently. Um, so like, yeah, like my version is that, that it's somehow AI is, is like super intelligent in dimensions that we like can't even appreciate and then limited, very limited in some other ways. And so it's like this lopsided AI, like where we have a, uh, I don't know if it's called complementary, but it's not, it's not like, uh, you know, like us, but better in every way. It's somehow worse in some ways and better in others. And that like, um, like most things in life. So exactly how that, and then that, how that surprises us and sort of what the consequences will be, I think are like a little hard to predict, you know, I guess you'd have to, to tell a story, right? You try to tell a story. The story would be, um, it's incredibly good at intelligence, but it's really bad at, um, yeah, at, at, at being at chaining together things in a highly like um, open-ended way, you know, in a, in a way where like where the future is just so it's really good at at, I mean, you know, super intelligent at, at in ways where we're where we're where we use as a tool, but somehow we it, it needs us or we need it to to be able to really be uh, able to chain the other things where it can be unattended for, for like, you know, forever. Like you, you couldn't, yeah. like when I, when I build software, like, you, you know, so much of the work is chaining the other things through like a series of like product decisions or product development and logic. I think it's going to be really good at that. But when you sort of, when, it, when you leave it open-ended, it may end up being like somehow, somehow limited. And then, and that yeah. limitation is like kind of like what I expect, at least in you know a reasonable time frame of like uh, you know less than less than a decade. <laughs> and by the way, I think uh, that's, anyways, like, that's um, like some some people who are maybe more in my world listen to that and they're like, ah, uh, no, intelligence is good for everything. So if it's intelligent that you know some one thing, it'll be intelligent in everything. But I actually think the story you're telling is plausible, and here's why. I um, to the extent that um. So, you know, the story of how these things are becoming intelligent and, you know, the story you would like to tell yourself about the very optimistic scenario where you get AI fast is that, um, it, you know, intelligence is just a hodgepodge of different skills um, at different layers of abstraction. And these models are just picking up more and more of them. The more data you have, the more compute you have. Now, if that's true, um, then you ought to, uh, and it's not just like a one big general, like, thing, you know, it's like sort of a little more specific, um, which it has to be if the story of like, if, if, if it is just one big general thing, then I think it's like a little more pessimistic about whether these models are on that track. It has to mm -hmm. be a bunch of like a bunch of different heuristics and circuits and whatever. Uh, only in that story are these things on the track to like general intelligence, human level intelligence. So if that's the correct model of what intelligence is, then, um, uh, th then you got to think about like what kind of training data do these things have? Well, they have a lot of data on how to write amazing uh, you know, programs and how to like build your, uh, your really nice websites and, um, you know, all kinds of other things the internet, that are very yeah. useful, but yeah. do they have a lot of data on the way in which Henry Kissinger will, um, uh, you know, talk to three different people and ha have, you know, put all of them against uh, one against each other and do this sort of like power maneuvering mm -hmm. in a way that like he comes out on top or whatever. Um, do they have training data on that? And do they have like, uh, you could tell stories about how they do, but I'm actually kind of skeptical. I think like that kind of thing, they might be pretty bad at it. And so they were like really good at short horizon. Like you for an hour ago, do my employee thing, but bad at like, I'm going to escape and I'm going to spend the next few years scheming to, you know, take over the resources of uh, AWS and you know, take, you know, take over, take it from there. Um, so I think what you're saying is very plausible. Yeah. I mean, it, the, sorry, just to not to push my point, but like, I, I expect, right, everyone will be wearing AI in the next few years. It'll have, like, and at that point when it has vision and it's listening to everything we're saying, it'll bring the data sets you're talking about, you know, a few years of 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 being sort of in every room, seeing everything and hearing everything. Like, it'll 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 sort of comp... It'll, a lot more data will fill in the holes it has. But, um, 
anyways, let me let me let me go back to the <laughs> back on track here. Um, <laughs> so okay, so um, what do you think is like most underappreciated by AI that most people wouldn't know? Hmm. Maybe one thing is the, what we spoke about, where it's like, it actually, if, if we're on track for AI soon, it ended up being not that complicated. You know, it's like, I, I you know, obviously they've added all these sorts of algorithmic improvements, but the basic, the basic like architecture here is like something I could explain, or, you know, somebody could explain to mm -hmm. a smart, uh, you know, a college student or something. And then you just make it much bigger and you train it for longer and you just like have it predict t internet text. And like, then you have something that's like intelligent, like that's wild. Right. And I, I don't know if people appreciate just sort of like, you just like get the thing just wants to learn. You just like get intelligence by default. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just by being able to predict what's about to happen. Yeah. It's and, and to... even even more fundamentally, it's like this just happened to be the training loss, the training because um, you need to give it some sort of loss function of optimize mm -hmm. for this. Um, and this just happened to be the one that corresponded to a bunch of Internet text. But basically, it just like it could have been anything, you know, it, it's like fundamentally, this is a compression test of you only have so many parameters. Internet text is way bigger than those parameters. Can you store Internet text? in in many fewer parameters than the internet is big and you just tr so you're basically teaching it how to do compression and then the story is basically that if you have something that is really good at compression you have something intelligent and it, that, that worked <laughs> i like that story it's like a more it's like very humbling yeah 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 and you know it goes to figure where if um the, you can look at ways in which humans are different from other primates and there's, I'm not a primatologist or something, so I don't know the evidence here, but obviously our brains are bigger, right? And in specifically, um, the, the ways, you know, scientists have looked at, well, is there anything special about our brain? And as far as I know, they haven't like necessarily found a s separate circuit. It's just that the thing is bigger. And as it gets bigger, there's more room to like accommodate things like language and uh, higher order thinking and so on. Yeah, more neurons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let let me switch like uh, to a different rhythm here. I I had a uh, rapid fire multiple choice questions for you. Try and, and uh, try to ground this in um, in like uh, kinds of things that will affect people. <clears throat> so I have uh, I think seven 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 or eight questions here. Ready? Okay. Um, okay. So it's 20, it's five to seven years from now, right? Approximately. So it needs enough time where like this conversation, we've, we've pretty much answered this conversation in about five to seven years, you know, the, the, at least the, the sort of like table stakes version of it, not super intelligence, but you know, did this play out to some sort of like general intelligence or did it end up being more like a narrow tool, narrow tooling for intelligence. So, um, so I guess there's like two versions of how you could answer this, but okay. So you're, but if you're looking at looking backwards and you know, five, you know, 2031 or something, did AI drive inflation or deflation? Oh, a defl Oh, interesting. Um, so That's really interesting, actually. Um, so you, the story for deflation is the same reason that, um, like, uh, let the Ch China manufactured a bunch of stuff for us, and the like the 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 fact that a bunch of stuff was manufactured causes deflation, or at least not deflation, but it counteracted inflation that would have otherwise happened in the early twenty first century, right? So mm -hmm. AI will manufacture a bunch of stuff for us and do a bunch of work for us, and that will be super deflationary. The story for inflation potentially is that. Maybe there's a few bottleneck goods that are uh, really crucial for um, the things that AI will want to do or need to do, things like compute or energy, especially energy. And to the extent that those are more limited by supply, um, then maybe throwing more money at it doesn't solve the problem. And when you have those kinds of 
um, su- uh, the supply is inelastic kinds of problems, then throwing more money at it does tend to be inflationary, where you see that with healthcare or um, housing, obviously, where we refuse to build housing, so that ends up being inflationary. So uh, maybe like energy will be, maybe it will be like sector by sector, where things like energy and computer components of the uh, hardware chain will be inflationary, but overall it'll be very deflationary. Yeah, Leopold said this on your episode, and I didn't, I just couldn't understand, and I know we debated it here at the office, but what he seemed to imply is that the demand for capital from AI would be so massive to build these clusters. Basically, the most yeah. productive use of capital is AI. If it starts getting like compounding success, like it just drives up the interest rate because it just consumes so much yeah. capital. I think that's what he was arguing. He was saying the interest rates go way up yeah. as a result of AGI, which which is counterintuitive to me because in traditionally like productivity growth and computers and things like that, technology drives um, deflation. Yeah. So, so I I, I was like I was str- I was uh, flummoxed essentially by his his argument because there's so much. Mm. Because by definition, like there's so much capital, it's like it's hard for me to think that the capital ends up being the constraint for for AI. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, if it's trillions of dollars, it, would, would it would it be the constraint? I don't think so, right? I mean, let's say you need a trillion dollar cluster. That's not a sort of that's not going to drive inflation. You need trillions of dollars, but then you'd have growth, and so it would be if you have a lot of growth and. Then it, sh- it shouldn't be inflationary. So I, he, he was sa- he was arguing that he thought bond prices and asset prices would collapse as a result of of R or of, you know whatever interest rates going up, real interest rates going up. And I was trying to f- track what he w- his argument was, and I just couldn't put it together. Oh, that 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 one. I think um, I'm actually not sure about the relationship necessarily between inflation and interest rates, but I I I, 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 I think I understand the one between um, bond prices and so forth. I think the bond price argument is that. Um, the rate of economic growth goes up. The um, the real interest rate will be match the in the long run match the rate of economic growth because if um, if the rate of economic growth is higher than the uh, interest rate, then it's like it's worth lending your money out to the person who's earning ten percent growth or whatever. And so then th- those two things will end up being in equilibrium. Um, but if interest rates go up, then obviously bond prices go down because like if you got a bond at like 4% interest, then it's worth less if you can lend it out to Microsoft at 10% to build their next cluster. And it's worth it I for see. Microsoft to borrow at 10%. I see. I see. Okay. I, okay. I get it. So I guess I'll, let me just try to recapitulate it. So one is if you have a long-term bond... Um, and real interest rates are very high. Essentially, it's it's depreciating rapidly because it has a fixed rate and and um, yep. know, with like sort of higher real rates than yep. than what was sort of forecast or embedded in the the bond price when it was issued. Yep. Um. Yep. Okay. Okay. So then the uh, next question I have for you, um. It was okay. Then we're out. Like looking, it's five years from now, six years from now, seven, whichever. Sort of around that time period. Um, if you think about it, it's like it's just like not this presidential next four years, but it's the next president you know, or next presidential um, four years. So it's not that far away, right? So, is unemployment a lot higher, the same, or lower? Unemployment measures how many people want jobs who don't have, but like it's it's measured as a fraction of people who are looking, right? Um, so I think you could have is with some sort of redistribution where most people don't even look for jobs, but the people who do look for them can find them pretty easily. Um, just because like you, if you're if you're not, I don't know, the AI can do it way better than you. Then you're not gonna um, you're not gonna be looking for a job that hard. But and but hopefully there will be a redistribution to take care of you. And there's like potentially jobs where even if an AI can't do them, we'd still just for sort of like temp- um, uh, temperamental reasons, we'd want a human to do them. I don't know how many of those there will end up being, but for those, I can actually Im- 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 um, imagine like they're worth millions of dollars, right? Like um, you, you you want like the the conventional answer here is like a human nanny. Um, 
I mm-hmm. don't, but honestly, I do think even those will be automated. Like if you really, like an actual human level AI could be a nanny for you with, and it's constantly paying attention to your kid. It's never going to be distracted. It's like, it's got all the emotional intelligence of a human or whatever. Then I'm like, yeah, I'm fine with a hu- AI nanny taking care of my kids. So, you know what? Um, then the question is mostly about redistribution. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to say, but I, I think, yeah, maybe, maybe just forget the galaxy brain stuff. High, on, high unemployment. <laughs> it seems... <laughs> yeah, yes. Because what you're saying is it, it does throw a lot of people out of work. Yeah. And so then, like, either they have to get a new job because there's new jobs that have been created by AI, or they don't need to get a new job because there's been enough economic windfall that they, they don't need to work. But you're, you're describing, like, a potentially, you know, I think, I think I did the math. I think there's 100 million knowledge workers in the United States. So, so you're talking about... Um, a huge number of people potentially having to change jobs. Right. No, I mean, I, I, I think this, I mean, eventually it's like, you're not going to have it. I think like the real story will be like, do you merge with the AI or not? Like, it's not about like whether you can still be a, uh, a server at Applebee's or not. Like, um, so, you're talking about like the singularity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the story here, right? Like, are you going to be able to be, a, if you've got AGI, it's like, I'm not that interested in like how many people get a job for the next ten years while the singularity happens. I'm like, what happens in the singularity? You know, I think that's the main story. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so unemployment higher. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna and then and then, um, <laughs> but maybe other things uh, compensating for it. So okay, um, house uh, median household income. So the average family household income in the last ten years went from fifty five thousand dollars a year to seventy five thousand dollars a year. So then, um, you know, 10 years from now or seven years from now, right, like household income on trend, like 2x, 4x? Uh, uh, Median, I think way, way higher. Because, you know, I just imagine, um, I mean, world output will just like 1,000x or something. So if world output uh, 1,000x's, then... To the extent that humans have it, either it goes to zero because it kills us all, but in the in like in the ninety percent of the worlds where that doesn't happen, I'm just imagining that people will be way richer because for the same reason, even somebody who's poor today is way way richer in terms of output or income than um, the the leader of a tribe uh, fifty thousand years ago. Okay, well, like, so if the if the average household you know income is a million dollars or ten million dollars, like. I think that's inflationary, by the way. <laughs> o- 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 only if the amount of goods doesn't increase, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just a challenge is that you're, it, you're, we're talking about five to seven years or seven to ten years, something re- relatively short. And that, that's just uh, things don't happen fast, usually yeah. without that much change, without either a lot of inflation or deflation. It's just... It's, oh, so, it's but, just, but I think like, then, house, then household income would also take a while to uh, come up. But, like... The reason it's a million is just that, you know, AI can produce so much stuff that it's the, the amount of stuff that you need the humans to produce um, y- y- with current resources that an average human family has. You, you'd be able to get way more with AI labor. Okay. Well, some of these questions that are going to be this, like, I, I feel like I know what the answer is going to be, but I was going to ask like stock market in five years. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're saying... <laughs> I was like two x four x, and you're like, you know, ten x, hundred x. I think there's worlds in which AI doesn't happen within the next five years, but I'm, um, I think even the AI progress we've seen so far it mm-hmm. is enough such that if GPT four point five five level models, if that's all we get, I'm still thinking people aren't. I think like you get a ton of economic growth from that alone, and uh, from that mm-hmm. alone, I think you would expect a lot of economic growth, even if AGI is decades away. Okay, so well then, how many ten trillion dollar companies are there in twenty? In five years? Yeah. Depends on how centralizing of a technology AI ends up being, and how um, whether any one of them can have a monopoly on some part of the supply chain. Whether one of them has increasing returns, 
I can imagine. It is like not impossible to imagine. Nvidia has this where it has you know CUDA and that gives it a privileged position within the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, you could imagine this with the companies making AI models because they're using the AI to make better AI models and so forth. Um, there's an interesting point that in previous in throughout history the more fundamental mm-hmm. a technological change is the harder it is for only one person to monopolize it mm-hmm. um for example did the creation of electricity result in any trillion dollar companies or inflation in just a trillion dollar companies not really um internet did um but you know going through history it's just hard for any one company to monopolize all the gains so so you're saying more than five <laughs> um, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Seems okay. But, okay. Okay. Um, where are those companies? Like, just just give me an allocation among U.S., China, Europe, and elsewhere. Man, if I knew, I wouldn't be hosting a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but lo- um, likely, likely U.S., China, Europe, and elsewhere. Right? Is you're saying this? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In fact, I'm like I'm sort of concerned about other countries because they, they don't have that much leverage in this post AI world. Okay, uh, okay. Next one. Next question. Okay, globalization. Does AI drive globalization more or less? Neither. Mm. <laughs> Tentatively less because the um, potentially the thing. Uh, to the extent that a lot of the things we get from foreign countries is just tokens, how much of India's exports are just tokens, then those are less valuable. Then there's also the angle of competition towards AGI, which will cause decoupling and export controls and things like that. And the story of hardware, like manufacturing the chips, is obviously one of globalization, right? Where ASML is in the Netherlands and Taiwan has... Um, TSMC and so on, but outside of those few countries, it doesn't really feel like anybody else. What, what country in Africa has a ton of leverage, or South America has a ton of leverage on the future of AI? And to the extent they don't, maybe they're going to be not that not that included in the post uh, post AGI order. Okay, uh, I, I actually did a podcast uh, uh, last month on uh, military technology, and one of the main questions with military technology. Is, is it is it centralizing or decentralizing? To yeah. su- to, and so, I think I know your answer. But is what do you think? AI is it does it ends up being centralizing? Like, think about media, think about government, think about yeah. lots of different consequences of it. Yeah, because of um, because of the intelligence explosion type dynamic, where if you have mm-hmm. an AGI, then that helps you make an ASI. I think that actually ends up being very centralized. And I think it has huge implications for, this is why people call for it to be nationalized because to the extent that it is a centralizing technology, then the question is who gets to centralize it and is it better that mm-hmm. it's some random startup or the government? I'm not sure I buy the logic, but I, I, you know, I, I sort of get where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, they tease me up here because I have a few policy questions for you. Um, sure. Let me, let me do the – let me go back to the, the thing we, you were saying or about, okay, so let's just say it, it drives, uh, you know, maybe 10 million people which have to change jobs, you know, a huge number, right? 10% of the knowledge workers doesn't seem even out of the realm of possibility. So what are the, like and, – and this happened to uh, U.S. manufacturing in the 1970s and 80s and 90s. Mm. Actually, I looked. It was, it was much less – U.S. manufacturing only lost 4 million jobs. We were we – went from uh, – um, I think two, maybe five million, twelve million to seven million U.S. manufacturing uh, workers in the United States mm. since 1970, uh, and that was obviously um, not a successful U.S. policy in terms of the transition to, in a lot of places. So, so what do you think are the the learnings or or like recommendations this go around that hopefully makes it more successful? I actually don't know that much about why, because, you know, one of the obviously basic economic concepts is gains from trade and to the extent that you have comparative advantage. I, I assume the story there was you can just do redistribution or something or like retraining and get those people back up to snuff in other modern uh, sectors. 
I'm not sure why it didn't work. I mean, the story here is like very di- different because like uh, we're expecting a future where no- there isn't any jobs, right? Like the retraining isn't for you're moving from manufacturing to service sector jobs, but go figure out how to spend time with your family or something. So um, I don't know what policy you could. Yeah, I'm not sure what policy levers you have there. I do think it's reasonable for there to be a decent amount of redistribution. Like right now, 40% of GDP or something is controlled by the government. And a lot of that goes towards redistribution. And you could argue that's maybe too high. Um, but if you imagine, let's say output increases 100x um, or something. And if we stay on course, so that 40% of GDP is still redistributed. The others go to the investors of Anthropic and OpenAI and whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that seems reasonable because it just like, I, I, you, okay, in other parts of the market, it's like, you, yeah, you deserve money if you came up with all these inventions and so forth. Um, do you deserve the entire universe? I'm like, I, I believe in capitalism, but that's a lot, you know. <laughs> I think it makes sense at that point to um, ha- have a decent amount of redistribution. So the, the, I feel like the two policy questions you hear out of about AI around sort of like the policies to get it right in terms of success, like actually produce produce it, and then also to keep it safe. Are there other AI policies you think that are also important that you know, or the next most important AI policies that like I can think of one you've talked about, but it's I'm I feel like the the safety one gets all the oxygen in the room, mm. maybe appropriately. <laughs> Um, I, you know, uh, I, I do actually want AIs to be sort of broadly deployed through the transition because one thing you would want to avoid is a scenario where you don't get to see, the world doesn't get to experiment with GPT-6 through 9 and it only gets GPT-10, um, something way more powerful. And it would be much better to have like slowly you have things which test out how um, how fragile is our internet systems and how how much sort of free alpha does something super smart have in the stock market and so on. I, so I think it would be a mistake from a policy perspective to prevent widespread distribution of AI as you develop it. Um, but I do think it makes sense to be like, okay, if you are in the worlds where, I don't think it's like, there's just a ton of unknown unknowns about how fast you can go from an AGI to ASI. And if you are in the world where it's relatively easy, then I think it's uh, it makes sense for the government to step in and say, "Listen, we gotta we gotta do this transition somewhat um, smoothly and slowly and in a coordinated way. You know, you can't just like you can't just make a god in your backyard like that. That part we could, we, we probably want more coordination around. But that from going from here to the AGI, I, I want that to be very widely distributed. I mean, based on the scenario, your the picture you're painting. Like I feel like the the actual like unexpected surprise to AI is that the general population will will dislike it so much that the government will start to try to try to shut it down. Yeah, and um, and so it's it's actually it's like nuclear, but times of you know hundred. Hmm. It because it's it's just like generally it's AGI or AI has positive effects but you know for for specifically someone who loses the job someone you know either is not getting redistribution or doesn't want to be you know getting hundred thousand dollars a year and no job and so it just becomes extremely politically unpopular and then you know the political powers start to try to to, to put a put a lid on it slow it down um, control it change it yeah, I, I, I do worry about that as well. Um, the other sort of countervailing trend potentially is if other countries are racing towards it too, then it, I, I think it might be difficult for. I actually, I'm not in Washington, so I'm like, I have, I don't have strong opinions here, but I, I don't, I don't know how it would work if it's like, on the one hand, it's super unpopular with the voters. On the other hand, it would be pretty unpopular if we let China win AI. Um, and I think those two things will be intention, no. Intention for sure. Uh, well, let me ask you then. Like, uh, like I was literally on my list, so you teed it up. So, like, what if, what if, you know, because of that tension, China wins? So, what if China wins AGI? So, sketch out this the world in that scenario. 
I yeah, I mean, I, I'm planning on going to China later this year to sort of get a better handle on what that would be like. But just because I'm like, I you know, I genuinely don't have a strong sense of what's going on there, what is the government thinking about, and so forth. I do imagine, obviously, it'll you know, it's not it's not a democratic society, you know, and it's um, it's one that's very concerned about the survival of the regime and propagation of the regime. And I imagine it'll be the all. I mean, one of the things that AI enables is widespread surveillance very cheaply you can just shove all, everything you do in a day into one of these models and it'll tell you like what they did blah 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 i imagine much more um much more surveillance the chinese are not hesitant about this at all i imagine this you know in current systems like think of uh, tiananmen uh where mm -hmm. that that was that situation they you know they it, it was pretty unstable because a lot of Chinese officers didn't want to enforce the orders of the government um, to enforce actions against the students protesting. If you have AIs who can enforce those actions, I think um, uh, preventing any sort of discontent or um, protest or organization among your population becomes much more plausible. And I, I really worry about that if... Uh, uh, authoritarian system gets the technology to do that. So, so a trillion dollars, let's just, let's just say that we need to build a trillion dollar cluster to, and that, that it progresses um, more or less as, as it has been progressing. Doesn't the government have to be involved? I mean, and, and, and doesn't that, is that, is it like a Manhattan project or is it, is that the wrong parallel? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I was trying to ask Leopold about is uh, if he thinks like all these capital markets are so liquid, why, you know, it seems like you could fund that without the ca uh, government. The reason the government would need to be brought in in his story is because you don't want to leak how you're doing the training to the Chinese. Um, and if he thinks on current course where uh, this, these are just startups, they don't have good infosec, they're going to leak it to the Chinese. Um, the difference with the Manhattan Project and this is that this, you know, the story goes that if you have ASI, then you can build pocket nukes. But, uh, and so, you know, similar to the Manhattan Project, because you can't just have any random person building nukes, you got to have the government building nukes, right? Um, the difference here is AI isn't just the technology to build pocket nukes, it's all the, also the technology to prevent, you know, missile defense. It's also, it, 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 nuclear weapons are clearly offensive in a way that AI is not. And mm -hmm. so, um, and it goes against the principle of what I was talking about, where you want, you want AI systems widely deployed so that they can stress test your systems and make sure your institutions are, as soon as you get something really smart, you're not just going to be totally overwhelmed. You, you like, you, you have workflows where firms can hire AI workers and, um, a, a loss can accommodate AI, uh, AI, you know, AIs and so forth. You you, you want to be ready for that. You don't want to just like get it out of nowhere. I feel like um, because I've listened to your podcast and I know a little bit about this. Like I, I, I'm following, I'm connecting the dots, but I just want to connect the dots for, for people because sure. the the jump from AGI from AI to AGI to ASI. And a lot of things you're saying sort of imply something that we have you haven't said, so I'll just say it, and you may, you can just sort of expand on it. But it goes something like AI is or AGI whatever is able to you know potentially do what a knowledge worker it would do, and then and then that knowledge worker or that AI is able to then design robots and nanobots and drones that. Can can then be built in factories, and then it can, and then the AI or, or or even ASI can control those those autonomous um, uh, machines, and those machines can then build more machines or do work or uh, you know operate in the physical world, not just in the virtual world. So I, like like the, I just wanted to just put those pieces together because you haven't yep. said it, and that's something that I think that like um, when Leopold was talking about that happening and happening like. You know, I don't know. It, he was like this decade. Yeah. I, I was like, uh, <laughs> I was like <laughs> both both skeptical and shocked, and then I've been worried about it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> what's um? And you're in Washington, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what's um? 
I don't know. Are people thinking about this there? What, what, what's, what's the vibe like? You know, um, I, when uh, uh, last, whatever, God, how many weeks ago was it? A week and a half ago when Trump was almost assassinated and, and it just seemed like the world changed overnight, I started reaching out to people I know who are kind of like come from the conservative policy movement to start meet with them to see what the conservative AI experts sort of believe because I, yeah. I, 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 and it's like, uh, the funny thing is that, and maybe the, you know, this is obvious, but like the, there's actually very little sort of mixing of there between the conservative or Republican policy thinkers and the, and the liberal ones, like they mm. kind of have two different ecosystems and they don't know each other very well. Like it's, um, it's like a strange but they, you know, in, in, in like business, actually, like people at Google know people at OpenAI and everybody knows each other. They kind of like fraternize. You don't see that same dynamic in, in politics. And so, um, and so it's, 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 um, there's very few people. It's a very small community, like of people who are actually trying to do this. They're getting tons of money. I mean, you're talking about like, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Vital, the guy, uh, from Ether. Um, mm -hmm. He he Vitalik. gave Vitalik. Sorry, so Vitalik gave five hundred million dollars to these like six dudes doing AI research about mm. AI doomsday, and then people were like, "Well, that's just crazy." These people, what are these six people going to do with five hundred million dollars? Right? Like, so there's it's it's like a name. It's like uh, it's like it's so it's the community so small and so divided and so like unlike sort of the tech industry where it sort of developed organically and, is, and there's a lot of people it's 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 um it's like anemic com compared to the kind of like um brain power and and the complexities you'd want to have thinking about it hmm yeah yeah that makes sense um yeah, hopefully, I don't, I don't know, hopefully, hopefully uh, the, the, I, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to think of with the podcast is, or at least I want to do in the future is have more concrete things to say about what makes sense here, what scenarios look plausible, what ought to be done in different scenarios. And um, in the next few months, I'm hoping to do more writing and thinking around that. Um, and yeah. Yeah, one of the one of the things that happens and it, it could be it could be a cynical view, but I think it's mostly what happens is that the policy views come second, and the political views are are first. So the policy views are then designed to fit the political views, not the other way around. And so, like, well, I don't know what the political views of of you know one party or the other on are these yet. I think is are are on this yet. I think it's going to evolve, but um, like you think the policy would flow from sort of like um, kind of first principles of, of like what's, what should you do if this were a scenario and, and it, and it, and it, and it doesn't, it yeah. flows from, you know, in the same way, like, you know, capitalism, you know, dollars decide, you know, decisions, you know, in, in politics, it's, um, you know, votes or, or, you know, it's, it's, a, yeah. so that's the currency. And so, the policy sometimes can, can, you know, just come out wrong. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, hopefully better decisions are made. That's why I was saying like you got to get the politics right on your AI. It's not just yeah. enough to get the policy right. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Um, okay. Two two last questions for you. Um, the the first is like okay, if, if you could ask one question of yourself in 2030 you live you know oh, you're, 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 you're reaching to the future but you can only get back like one or two words like it's really it's a it's a the line is is a lot of static like what's the question and and what that you want to ask <clears throat> oh you can only get back one word one or two words you're really constrained on, on what you can get back you can't get like uh you know a few paragraphs. What happened back. with AI? You can't get back like an essay. <laughs> yeah, what happened with AI? Right. It's like you, you, you come back with three words, two words. Um. Okay. I, 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 this is not that interesting of a question, but I'd be like, in your estimation, how many years away is HEI? And feel free to include <laughs> negative numbers. <laughs> okay. Okay. I thought you were going to ask how many ohms 
they were at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, that'd be interesting, too. I, I think that would give you a lot of information. Like, how, how big is the biggest cluster um, in, 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 you know, in terms of... Um, you, I don't know if you want to ask effective compute, because, like, by, by 2030, maybe they're not even thinking in those terms. But, like, yeah, how many megawatts or gigawatts is the biggest cluster? Um, and, but I don't know if that's even the most relevant question, right? I, I think really do think it's a question. Oh, you know what? I, mean, you, I, don't, think you, I don't think you want to ask about AGI. I think you want to about, ask about ASI. Because like, I think mm-hmm. if, if um, that gives you the most amount of information, because if they're like, ASI is 2100, it's like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe AGI took longer, or maybe that they've learned something about intelligence that suggests that ASI is much harder, or who knows. But um, So you ask artificial I, super intelligence, give me how many years away. Yeah, uh, in your, yeah, in your opinion, how many years away is super, super intelligence? Okay, okay. Uh, okay, last question. Um, this is more like a, a philosophical question. So, so in the year 1711, a British poet, uh, Alexander Pope, coined the phrase, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Okay? So the only constant in history has been human fallacy. But we're, here we are like, sort of creating like a, an artificial human. Like it's not human. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a different kind of intelligence that may rival us or surpass ours and and then we'll i think we'll integrate it into our lives that's that's been sort of implied in everything you said and it's going to end up helping with decision making and and it's going to have um different biases and inclinations right that seems like likely very very likely so um which human errors do you think ai is likely to mitigate and which do you think is likely to Amplify. Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, one of the big hopes for AI and in terms of improving our decision making is having AI give us advice on like what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what are the actual odds of something happening. And that'll help us improve our decision making. So just general calibration around you can ask the AI, hopefully, you can ask the AGI, like when will super intelligence happen? What should we do about it? What um what are the biggest clusters in the world? What, are, uh, what, how, or should we be worried about misalignment? What is the best way the AI should be governed? Um, some of these questions may be harder for AI systems to answer. Some of them might be easier, but um, maybe maybe the, the thing I'm trying to get at is more calibration of like getting more concrete numbers, especially you have prediction market type things and the AIs can bet on them. Ha- just knowing, ha- having specific numbers on things. And in what way will it make our decision making worse? Once it amplifies our errors, but yeah, but either you, know, so you could you can answer it how you will. I think just like the fact of AI makes our decision like it, it's so unlike everything else in human history that it's much. If, if this is the internet, it's so much easier to think about what the internet will be like than what AI will be like. So. The AI isn't causing our errors to be worse, but the fact that it is something so new just makes it much harder to think about. And I think our decision making and maybe not decision making, but at least our sort of ability to make predictions and so forth is worse with AI. And to the extent that I've been overconfident or pretending I have a a lot of confidence in the rest of the episode, I do want to like really flag that I'm like part of it. I'm like trying to explain how SF people think, or at least some of the some of the people in SF think. Um, but I, I have a ton of uncertainty about how this is going to shake out and what we ought to do about it. Well, let me just give you like, uh, what, what I thought about this first question. Let me, let me come back to your coda. Uh, so I feel, I, I feel like if I distill what people are worried about and also what I think is likely is that sort of it, it so the AI, um, in terms of human errors, it, it improves, uh, or, or eliminates cognitive bias. Right, so many of the cognitive biases are like these evolutionary um, leftovers, you know, recency bias and you know availability bias and all these cognitive biases mm-hmm. and 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 so I feel like that's something that um, I mean you think about productivity consequences of just that, which I feel like it doesn't. You don't need AGI to actually mitigate or even eliminate most of these cognitive biases. Like it's like um, you know even even good ML. Right is is yeah. it's more fact based, <clears throat> so I feel like that's that's like the my expectation. The one that I'm worried amplifies 
and I think this is sort of, sort of thematic when people worry about AI, is that it's, it, it amplifies sort of versions of greed and, and power-seeking. Whether it's mm. a bad actor who gets AI, right, and, that, and is sort of just like President Xi lives forever and has AI and, and sort of yeah. takes over the world, like Putin, you know, right. or the AI itself is, is a version of that, right? So like, I yeah. feel like those are the – but it's mostly distillation of, I think, what people are saying. <laughs> That's actually a really good answer. Um, cause I, I think the stakes are so much higher I mean, the stakes are higher, you're sort of decision making can become erratic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and there, and there's, um, uh, contingency in history, right? That's right. Uh, yeah. And go back to the coda, right. I mean, I was excited about this episode because I mean, the fact that there are hundreds of people who are really, really smart and really, and way more knowledgeable and inside the room thinking and talking about it this way like the further away you get from it the more like skeptical and less concerned you are about it yeah which is like um you know uh, uh, i think that dynamic alone is kind of like reflected in the, my my comment about politics and and people mm. don't like change that happens rapidly yeah and so figuring out ways to to bring the knowledge and the information and the stories to to sort of everyone, not yep. just the people who are in the room. I think it's, it's important. It's totally. why I love your podcast. Totally, totally. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. Um, yeah, that, that's that's very important. Um, just because, you know, the, right now it feels like you're, you, if you're one of these people, you can feel like uh, it's the decisions of the people in this room that matter. But over time the rest of the world will have leverage in what happens in the future here. And to the extent that they are not, uh, they don't have the full picture. They, they, but more fundamentally, it's also, you know, you're, if you're really good at AI research, it doesn't really mean you understand geopolitics or, um, how, how to think about like political philosophy. Cause ultimately questions about alignment are often about almost political, uh, philosophy questions. Right. So, you 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 can't just be like I know how to make uh, GPT six and therefore I'm like I'm going to plan the rest of uh, the course of humanity myself. It's it's I think it has to be a much more distributed um, question. Yeah, yeah. I mean the challenge is that I, that most people most people don't trust the the people in San Francisco making the decision, but they also don't trust the people in Washington D C make the decision. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so distributed, like truly distributed, w would not only help. I think improve the decision making, uh, but also the buy-in because it's if it happens rapidly and and people aren't brought along, and it's not distributed. I think it it almost uh, guarantees it won't go well. Yep. Yep. Totally. Yeah. So well, uh, Dwarkish, it was awesome. I mean, you know, everybody should listen to your podcast. I feel like it's because it's not just about technology, about everything, about history, about. I, I, I was like Googling before this call to see if the next Robert Carroll book was going to come out. And I haven't, <laughs> apparently there's still no news. <laughs> yeah. I've been meaning to reach out to him. Um, I, I should do it. <laughs> or yes, I should, like, please. Try, try to make an effort. Uh, to... Definitely. Should, yeah. Actually, I always tell people on the team, the best way to get a yes is to go in person. It's so, it's, in, it's so powerful to just show up, get a hotel room, go there, be like, oh, I can't. Uh, you can't do it right now. Well, but tomorrow, you know, whatever. I mean, it's it's just a. I don't know where he lives. It's 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 you, incredible you how much. Or you do. I don't, I don't don't know where he lives. I'm sure we oh, can yeah. find out. But I mean, yeah. it probably lives in some like you know, I imagine bucolic location in Vermont or something. But like, I feel like it's um, if you want something done, you you do it. You go you go in person, and make it happen. Yeah, I and think I, you're right. So I hope you do because I because I feel like that that. Um, no one like you has talked to him. Yeah. And, um, and it's like, it's not just the book, right? It's, it's his thinking. It's everything. That's right. It's, 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 it's nothing like it out there. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm trying to find another book like it and there's, there aren't, aren't any. So <laughs> no, you, I think you're so right. I mean, I, I, and also another thing that happens is like guests die or people you would want to interview die. James mm -hmm. Scott, somebody whose books I really like, I was, I had vague intentions of like, I, I even had a half or an email I'm like, going to send to him because I want to interview him. Um, he's the guy who wrote the, um, seeing like a state and, um, against the grain and yeah, he just died last week and you know, 
like not you can't interview him anymore. And I think Robert Caro is pretty old. I, I want to make sure I got an interview in. And that actually, I mean, this is like a, this is a famous real estate investor named Sam Zell. Mm. And, and I actually had him booked for my podcast on like May 4th and he died May 1st. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, life's short. So yeah. I hope you do. And I, then, and yeah, then I'm going to have to, um, you have to tell, ask him why the book hasn't come out yet. I'm yeah. sure he'll love that. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. All right. All right. Uh, well, it's a pleasure. Uh, onward. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me, Ben. Oh yeah. It's awesome.